Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Well, Dr. Henry Cloud, welcome back to the podcast. I I was joking with you. I'm seeing you more than I see my regular counselor now. We're just on all these calls together in this season, but it's good to have you on my leadership podcast. Well, that's great because I can screw you up and your regular shrink can fix you. So (laughs) team effort. That's a great plan. Oh, man. Well, Henry, um, in some of the conversations we've been having uh, during this uh, coronavirus season, which seems to be extending, uh, I'd love to start here. Uh, it's, not, for, it's not our season, right? It's kind of gone into, uh, this is like how we live now. Is it? Yeah, exactly, right? Because it's like, well, vaccine, yeah, at some point. Um, man. One of the things you and I have talked about that I want to bring to leaders listening to the leadership podcast is this collective loss of control. Um, They're just, I don't think there's ever been a season where the world has felt uh, probably more unknowable, uncertain, and this loss of control. How does a loss of control impact leaders in particular? What, What challenges can that bring, Henry? You know, Carrie, it's it's one of the biggest challenges, <clears throat> and and I would say this. You know, negotiating that challenge is is you know you you, you always hear the same. What's the most important thing? Well, I don't know, air, water, or food. Which one do you want to pick? <laughs> but it's like one of the biggest things that leaders have to negotiate. Well, and and what I would say and what I see in in my CEO type clients are. The ones that do do this well are the ones that are doing really well. Now, I'm going to back up for a second and and just start with why. You know, we always kind of make fun of people being control freaks, right? But the reality is God has made you to be a control freak. He's wired your brain to be a control freak. If we take a toddler and and, and let's play the little game where I hit the hammer and, and I say, you know, watch me, Billy. And he's watching and we hook a brain scan up. He's watching me do it, and his brain's kind of got some activity. But then I say, okay, now you do it, and I give him control. His brain just explodes. Now think about this. That's the image of God. God is omnipotent. You are potent without the omni. And so you're wired to have control. Now here's the problem. We fell, and when we fell, The wish was to be omni. So we want to control everything instead of the one thing we were designed to control, which is the fruit of the spirit, ultimately self-control. Okay. So leaders that get this change the world. And here's what you've got to do. See, what it does is when you lose control and you have less choices, you used to could call a meeting, go to a restaurant, let's set up an offsite. You've lost all those choices. And what happens is that really screws with the brain. And it hits a shutdown mode and goes into a known place called learned helplessness where your brain just starts to think, well, there's nothing I can do. I don't have control anymore. And that really, 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 really stops your brain from working. That's why people feel lethargic and they're in a daze and all this kind of stuff. So we've got to reboot that system. And get you back in control of what? Of what you can control. Now, what can you control? You can control yourself. All right. Now, here's what I want them to distinguish. See, people think, well, I've got control of my company. No, you don't. (laughs) Even in normal times, right? Even in normal times. You have stewardship and responsibility and control of your company. I understand what you mean by that. But the just like you have control of a car, right? I got control of the car. Well, 
actually what you've got control of is the steering wheel and the pedals. That's what you have control of. So if they can distinguish, okay, here's the car, here's my church, here's my organization that I am in charge of, or a team, or a department, and realize, but what drives what I have control of, this organization, what drives that is what I truly have control of, and that's my own activities. How I turn the wheel, when I hit the brake, when I hit the pedal. So here's what the great ones do. They stop being omni-controllers, and when they see something, in their sphere of control, the context of the control, their stewardship, that's not working, they don't freak. They ask the question, what can I do that's going to move the needle on what I'm seeing? Those are the winners because they're not freaking out. They don't feel powerless. They they realize, like one of my clients said, I, I quoted this in Boundaries for Leaders, you know, he's saying, my team's got bad morale. And I said, why is that? He said, well, I hired this guy from another company. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, you know, he had been about, I kept saying, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Because I was driving him to a point. He finally looks at me and goes, okay, I guess I am ridiculously in charge, right? I said, yeah, you are. So what are you going to do that's going to move the needle on all of that? And when they get that, then they start to, Make this little column of what I have control of and what are the key priorities, the needles that I want to move. And then from there, what are the specific brake pedals, steering wheels, activities that are going to move that needle? When they get that right, they they change worlds and they have fun and they calm down. See, that's so helpful. I love your driving analogy. Um because I think you're right. In normal conditions, we have control of the brake and the pedals and the steering wheel. Uh, and these aren't normal conditions. So I'm Canadian. I guess in California, you guys have rain occasionally two or three days a but, year. But, but, but to, to, to make the analogy complete there, in normal, you always have control of those things. Yeah. In normal conditions, you feel like you have control of your route, mm-hmm. the speed you're going to go whether you stop for a sandwich on the way. And Canadian, what happens when a blizzard comes in? So you find out, I don't have control of that, but I still have control of the steering wheel. Exactly. And I've got to change my activities to negotiate that context. That's why I love that analogy, because I think you're right. It gives you the illusion of control. It's a beautiful summer day right now while we're recording this. And so we'd be in normal conditions, but a thunderstorm hits or in the winter, a blizzard hits. And right. anybody, I have two sons, I train them to drive in the winter. They both happen to have winter birthdays. And I always thought those people who learn how to drive in the winter have an advantage over those who turn 16 in the summer when you can drive. Because oh, I, oh, I, that's I had to teach them how to drive great. in the worst possible weather. That is so smart. You know, the, the Navy SEALs have a saying that nobody rises to the challenge. That is a total 100% myth. And when they study study sports, people, you know, like you want him to take the last shot at the buzzer and they send some people and they do the stats. It's just not true. That's the guy that would make the shot anyway. Right. Okay? So here's the thing. Nobody rises to a challenge. Here's what the SEALs will tell you. You fall to your level of training. Mm. All right. That's why the Bible uses the word test. It's like a a fishing line. We're going to test it. We're going to find out what its capacity is, not asking it to make 1600 on its SAT and rise to the challenge when they don't know their math tables. That's (laughs) not going to that's not going to happen. So what you're doing there is you are training them at this level. And summer comes along and they're like, you know, oh, this is easy compared to what I learned in January. You know, pinch their girlfriend if they want. They can handle (laughs) taking their eyes off the road for a second. So, okay, well, this is this is fun, Henry, because I've been always looking for words of encouragement and hope. It's a Stockdale paradox. You never lose hope, but you confront brutal reality. But I hadn't had this thought. That's why I love these conversations with you. 
for young leaders listening, and you got thousands of young leaders listening, like for some of some of you, this is your first year, right? You're probably being trained right now at a level that people like me who entered under normal conditions wouldn't have to face. Could that be an advantage if you're in the early years of your leadership and you're trying to pivot and move and change and adapt in the middle of this? Can that actually work to your advantage long term? It can work to your advantage as long as, and this is such a great, such a great um, question and way to think about this. It can work to your advantage if you don't let the context shape the basic disciplines. All right. So think about this. If you have, if you have, um, if you're teaching somebody skydiving, right, or you're teaching, you know, even the driving analogy or whatever, you don't want them, you know, so I'm a competitive golfer and I have been since I was a kid and that's been my life. Okay. You go on the range where there's no wind, <laughs> you know, there's there, because you're learning to get it right in the basic disciplines. Then to have to negotiate and include in your training all these difficulties is great and fantastic, but you don't want to let that context build the disciplines because then you're, you're you know, it's like if you learn to run on a pebbly road, you're going to develop a weird gait. Now you have a good, strong gait, then you can negotiate a pebbly road. But I like like the SEALs, let's learn how to block and tackle first. And then we're going to put you out there and let some 275 pound guy come at you. That's great training. But I don't want to be learning how to go on the field like this. You know, I got to get the basic disciplines. That's why basic boot camp disciplines are so important. One one quick example of this, Kerry. I I, I had the dream of a lifetime uh, happen earlier this year. I got an invitation to to fly down to Palm Beach and spend a day with Jack Nicholson and play golf with him. Oh, my gosh. And and then spend the the evening at his house with dinner and just talking and asking me anything. Oh, Henry. And so I was asking him all sorts sorts of questions. There was a a, a small group of us. And I said, did you make any big swing changes? And he started laughing. He said, he said, I read about these guys that like they get a new teacher and change it. He goes, no. He said, I would always make adjustments to get back to who you are and the way that you're formed. Now, if you're formed in a wrong way, that's the right. story. But but here's what he told me. He said, I think he said it was 1979. He says, the worst year I had had ever. He said, I don't think I want a tournament. You know what he did? He went back to his childhood coach, Jack Grout, and he said, teach me the game again. Oh, wow. He's the greatest player in the world. He won yeah. tons of major tournaments. He said, teach me again. Let's start with the grip. And then I want to go to the stance. And he went back to those fundamentals that grounded me said that year he won two majors either that year or the next year and see what happens is the war gets us out you know you play in the wind long enough and you're like <laughs> you're leaning over yeah 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 so it's a good question it's good but don't leave the basics guys don't leave the basics don't leave the basics. Please don't leave. Basics. So I don't know how to answer this question or ask this question, but let's just say to the leaders who are in year one, two of their leadership, which is a good chunk of people listening, you know, they're graduating college, they got their first jobs in the marketplace or in the church world. And they're like, well, this is really abnormal. So how do I learn the basics when it's this crazy? What would you, what would you say to them? Say that again. Oh, well, to those leaders who are learning for the first time. I literally have gotten messages from leaders who are like, my first day as a pastor was March 1st, 2020. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Right? And and, Hi, I'm a deckhand, Captain of the Titanic. Are we going for a ride? (laughs) 
<laughs> so the question is, what do you say to them when there's no natural conditions? Well, that's a great question. It is, and this is where, if if you are the leader, yeah, okay, then and you're starting there, don't take another step without finding a or a couple of really, really, really good, strong mentors and coaches. Okay? Don't take another step. You know, I think I think the way it, it in the Greek, the Greek says, you know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. Right. You're just new. Right? Now you have an advantage because you're going to learn in some really interesting times, you're going to know stuff that 30 year veterans don't know. But you've got to have, you know, think of a rose bush growing up. What do we do? We put it on a lattice. And a lattice is a structure and it grows up according to that structure. That's why we use training wheels. You know, kid doesn't develop bad habits. That's why. All sorts of things happen with a structure. The word structure, literally, the etymology of the word is is basically it means to build. Like a building is a structure. Right. So you've got to have some basic structures and disciplines that you're probably going to have to get from somebody who knows what they're doing. Get a coach, get a mentor. I hope you've got some elders sitting around you that didn't just fall off the truck. That You know, some business people that have led things. And, and and get some people to develop you. It's the best thing you can do. It is mm-hmm. the best. If you if you read my book, Power of the Other, I list, there's a whole list in there of super high performers, super high performers. And it lists their mentor right next to them. And each one of them, each one of them has that name. And they have talked about it. I want to go back. That's really helpful. I want to go back to loss of control. And what that does to your brain circuitry. Um, what are some healthy ways to seek control? And I love the focus on self-control, both theologically, that's what we're designed to have by God. Uh, but also it makes a lot of sense, of course. It shouldn't be a surprise that it does. Uh, well, you, but, you, you have kids. How, how much control do you have? Yeah, you know what none. I, mean? I, I go crazy when I hear these parents say, well, the most important thing, you know, with kids is you've got to get control of them. Are you kidding me? Is that what you want? You want to have control of your kids? Or would you rather you have kids that have self-control? Because if they don't have self-control, Bubba, you can't leave the house. (laughs) Right? You're right. I want them to have self-control. So what do I have control of? Exactly what Galatians 4 says. The children are under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. Well, what does that mean? You guard them, how? By your own activities. You set limits, okay? You have consequences. You guard them from regression to immaturity and avoiding being dropped off at school when they're afraid and have a school phobia. You you keep them from regressing to an earlier stage and you guard them from trying to be bigger than they are and driving the car at 12, okay? So you protect them, but you also manage them, and that's what a leader has. You manage the process of their getting results through controlling what you can control, the coaching, the resources, the rewards, the incentives, the outcomes, the putting the teams around them that they need. You have control of a lot of stuff, but they have to have self-control of producing. And that will get you out of a lot of anxiety. I've heard you talk about the three Ps. So this has been an extremely discouraging season for a lot of leaders, highly challenging. And a lot of leaders listening are bumping up, up, up against failure. And sometimes failure can look like I'm not sure we're going to make it or we're out of money or I'm just exhausted. Sometimes it can look like, wow, we're not as big as we were, or it's just so uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen. You mentioned three P's that happen. Probably all that list is true, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you have outliers that have, you know, tons of money in the bank and all this, but you know, most, 
Yeah, I mean, even the big companies I, I work with in the early days, number one, number one, number one, number one, number one was first thing they did is preserve cash. Yeah. You can't run out of fuel. I mean, even the biggest and highest and most successful ones. So they went into preservation. So don't feel bad if you find yourself with that list that Carrie just said. And and so in light of that, I've heard you talk about three Ps, like when you bump up against failure. Uh, and I'd love for you to talk about that. I think the first one is personal, and then I'll let you tell the story. But that has really sunk with me. And I'm like, oh, I look back on all the times I've taken hits, even under normal conditions. And like when I get into self-pity mode and I get into that bad sinkhole, those three Ps are so yeah, true for me. Yeah, it, um, it actually comes out of that that learned helplessness research I was talking about earlier that, yeah. that they they found when people feel like like things are affecting them that are outside of their control, then, you know, as I said, your brain shuts down. And with that shutdown, you have clinical symptoms, okay? Depression, anxiety, stress, burnout, your sleep patterns will change, your energy levels will change, your libido will change, your appetite will change, and your concentration will change, as well as what we call the executive functions, which are creativity, problem solving, linear thinking, ability to sequence, ability to release resources in the right amount at the right time, ability to have wider range of options in your head than a few, and all a bunch of stuff. Those are all biochemically empowered. Your computer's got to be plugged in, okay? So when the brain changes in an out-of-control state, it's like having a power outage. And that's why that's why you feel like you do. That's how God wired us. So, so that's why I talk about rebooting, you know, rebooting the system. Now that's the hardware side of it. What Carrie is just referred to. Don't talk to you or them. We're talking, we're in a big talk group to here. them. Talk to them. Yeah. They're listening. Carrie, what what you're referring to there, what we'll have this conversation is um is the software. And so what the software does is it changes and then it interprets data. Okay, if you have software, you you put in data, Excel spreadsheets going to do something with that. Yeah. Okay? There's a formula and it takes it to a a you know, a sum or something. You you get a piece of data like you go online, you look at how many people do we have attending online on Sunday. And that number's down. Or you ask, how are our donations? That number's down. Or you ask, what was the feedback on my sermon? That number's down. <laughs> or when I got to the middle part, that I felt like was my main point, we didn't see any happy faces. Or you know, whatever the piece of data <laughs> is, all right? Your new software in this mental state that's changed because you've lost control, your mental software interprets that with three Ps. Number one, you personalize it. You personalize it. Oh, whatever made me think I, I could preach. <laughs> I knew I should have had more. I should have done that, that capital campaign and raised all that money before. I, I should have hired a, why didn't I think of why didn't I study more for that? But some way you end up feeling bad, not good enough. That's the first P, you personalize it. Second P, well, it's not just a sermon. I mean, it's the finances. It's the team I've hired. You know, my my elders, I picked the wrong, el the elders suck. My, my, the city, I mean, industries, why did I even, this play, this town, being a pastor is horrible. I hate my life. <laughs> yep. It all goes bad. That's the second P. It's called pervasive. Uh -huh. Now that one, one little bad input has hit the button for subjectively, it's all bad. Now, there's a reason for that. It's coming out of a certain part of your brain that has no sequencing, has no categories, has no ability to, to objectify things. It just all, I just all feel like, you know, Everything's bad, right? Yep. And then you go, I bet next Sunday it's not going to be different. In fact, I bet a month from now it's not going to be. 
I don't know if we're ever going to come out. Of we, I don't know if it's ever going to get better. Now the third P is permanent. Hmm. So now hope is gone. Yeah. And you're done. You just feel like crap and you can't move. You don't know what to do. That's why we have to reboot the system. I I just want people to hear that. Like, Henry, I've heard you mention that a few times, and that's why I wanted to share it with this audience. It's like personal. Yep, I go there. It's me. I suck. Pervasive. Everything sucks and everybody does. And, you know, it's the whole industry. And why did I even do this? And permanent. (laughs) I'll never change. Like, this this is my sentence. And I just think there's so many leaders who are in that place right now. And uh, now I want to know how to reboot the software. So thank you. That, that has been such a gift to me. And yeah. uh, I, can, I can look back on two and a half, three decades of leadership and go, oh, that's what that was. Because I can end up in that sinkhole unless I'm really careful. So what do you do if you're there? Well, can I suggest a couple of resources? I'm not- A hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, let's go I'm there. I'm not trying to add here, but- um, but if you go to boundaries.me, boundaries.me, that's a platform that where I become kind of your online coach. And, and one of the one of the um, you know, there's three kind of subject areas that all that content around. One's clinical, how you feel, their depression, anxiety, and all that. The other's relationships, and third was performance. And there's a lot of stuff in there that that would help this. Now, specifically the three P's on their own, that's in there too. But the, the, the program we're talking about here that that you're referring to, Carrie, is I wrote about it in Boundaries for Leaders. And so if you t- t- take a look in there, it goes into depth. But to answer the question, there's basically four things of how to reboot the, the system. The first thing is you must get connected in your vulnerability. See, connected you know, we all go to parties, but we dress up in a tux at a wedding or a suit or something. And that's not connection. That's at the surface level. Where we get, where the brain starts to change is when we weep with those who weep. When we're in our weakness, where Paul said, Paul said he was so depressed. Okay, this is Paul. He said, So he's reaching out to God and he said, but God who comforts the depressed sent me the evangelical list. Well, you pray more. You memorize scripture. (laughs) No, that's not what it says. It says, God who comforts the depressed sent Titus to me. Mm. You hardly can go very far with, you know, without reading Paul's letters where he starts or ends with, I was refreshed by the coming of so-and-so. So, and I've seen leaders in crisis, you know, just over and over and over get rebooted. When I've done projects, for example, with big companies, you know, in 08 on Wall Street, I took, we, we, I de- designed a program to get stockbrokers, 10,000 of them in small groups around the branches all over the country. We flew 500 branch managers into Dallas for three days, and I designed a small groups program for their highest performers. And they start sharing about what they're going through, how much anxiety they feel, what their brain's doing. So connection is number one, where you need the support, but from a vulnerable place. Number two, you've got to, you've got to, get back in control, okay, of what you can't control. It's what we talked about earlier. I won't, mm. won't go over it again, but you make two columns. Here's all the crap I can't control. The economy, when's the vaccine going to come? When's it going to open up? All that stuff I can't control. And then you make the list of the priorities, but the activities that you do have control of that are going to move the needle in some way, okay? The third thing, is it's very important to realize the thoughts you are having that are negative are not real thoughts, okay? Those are biologically created farts in your head. (laughs) And you think they're thoughts, but they're farts. When your stress hormones go up, the brain farts, negative stuff because stress hormones are by definition activating the system that fears 
That's the way God designed it. So when a train's coming, you jump off the track. Ah, all hell is breaking loose. It's designed to be negative. Or you would drown. So what your brain does, it starts to produce thoughts that explain why I feel this way. Well, it must be because I suck. It must be because the whole world is bad. If you treat those as thinking, then you're done. Yeah. Right? But yeah, that's not thinking. You're right. It's not thinking. Have you ever been under stress and awakened at three in the morning and had the thought of, can't wait for tomorrow, I'm going to win the lottery? <laughs> You've never had a positive thought that your stress brain created. You never, it doesn't, it won't do it. But that's hardware. Okay. There's a difference between your brain and your mind. Your mind is not hardware. It's not biochemical. And it's not physical neurons sitting in a big marshmallow on top of your head with a, you know, endocrine system driving. That's material. Your mind is immaterial. So the people that get out of their mind can't make it. The people get out of their brain and into your mind, make it. Now, you've got this whole new industry out there called mindfulness. Well, aren't you guys smart? You invented this thing called mind. No, you didn't invent it. Go back to Psalm 139. And God says, get above your thoughts. God, observe, try my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me, what are the paradigms that are predict? Why? And we get above our thoughts. We become mindful and you get above them and you don't pay attention to them other than to notice them. You don't, it's like a bird flying over your head. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head. But like the Baptist preacher said, you have a lustful thought. You can't stop that from coming, but you don't have to capture the bird and help it build a nest in your head either. Right? Yeah. So you're going to let all that stuff go by. And you're going to have what the New Testament calls the mind of Christ. Taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That takes us to the third thing. I want you to log all of your crazy thoughts. Like write them down. Write them down. Literally write them down. I had Barron's top 50 performers writing down their negative thoughts that kept him from picking up the phone and calling, you know, a $20 billion client. I think about it. They tell me I can't pick up the phone. I know the client's going to hate me. Okay, write that down. My client's going to hate me. <laughs> so then on the other side of the column, you're going to write down truth that disputes that thought because that puts a limit on it. Okay. This is so much research behind this. Hmm. Well, think of the three P's. I suck. I'm not good enough. Ephesians 2.10 says, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for that very work that you say you suck at. And that work has been laid down and beforehand that you should walk in them. That's the truth. You shut up, thought. My mind is going to rule you. Romans 12, by the transforming of your mind. So we're going to, the second one, it's all bad. Come on. <laughs> are you kidding me? What flood? What lions in the den? Yeah. What water rising around the mountaintops? That's not what the book says. This isn't the problem. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world, Jesus said. So we're going to have your favorite verses. Where I do it right now. Okay. I'm a little bit of, in one area in life, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe because I got food poisoning one time and went to the trauma center and didn't think I was going to live. So that's the only area I kind of have germ issues mm -hmm. around, you know, how long has the kitchen, you know, how, how, how long has that chicken, chicken been cooked? Yeah. How long, exactly. My wife laughs at me. But in COVID, I noticed it's starting to generalize like, ah, where's the bug, you know? Well, every morning and every night, every morning and every night since since this hit, I meditate on Psalm 91. Hmm. Psalm 91 says, 
the plague will not touch you. It won't come near your tent. God is going to bring. So it says you won't fear the plague that comes at, or the pestilence at the midday yeah, yeah. and the plague that comes at night. Every time I get germ public out there, I go to the store and, you know, I touch something and I go, I'm not going to fear the plague that comes at night. I'm doing the things that I can control. I'm washing my hands. I'm not touching my face. It's gone. So you've got to, this is really, really important to rebooting the system. Okay. And then also adding some structure, adding some structure, scheduling things, having a routine every morning. And I am, I mean, guys, I am the least OCD, anal, color coded socks and underwear. I don't usually know what day it is. I'm so (laughs) right brain, you know, I can't find my way out of a phone book, out of a phone booth. We don't have phone booths anymore, do we? I mean, literally. But I have found that there are certain, you don't have to get anal about this, but I have certain structures that calm the machinery down. Every morning I put a worksheet out there, pretty much. These are the four things, three things that I've got to drive forward today. And these are the two or three activities or steps that each of those are going to entail doing. Keep it small, keep it big, keep it simple. Keep it small, small list, big important things only. Right, stuff you need to move. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. Your brain will work better. Oh. If you get through that that list, you know, you don't know the future. I love to think about how, how to deal with the uncertain future in Martin Luther's church. You know, they they asked Martin Luther one time, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do you find the will of God? Would you, he goes, well, first I go to the word because a lot of it's really, you know, it's right there. there. I get the answer. Yeah. He said, if I don't find it there, then I go to prayer. And I pray about it. Then if I don't know, I go have a few beers. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a place. Luther quote. You got to let it go, man. You got to go hang out with your buddies and say, I don't know. You know, I, I know in one <laughs> of the I can do. early lockdown conversations you and I had, uh, I think we're probably weeks into the crisis and everything was at that time feeling like it was spinning out of control. And I made a joke with you, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, uh, behind me is my library. And, you know, like you, I get books sent to me almost every day by publishers and authors and a lot had accumulated and... I'm a little more OCD, so I just organized everything. I took out about two or 300 books that I thought it's time to give away. I made sure that everything went back to a color coding system. And I thought, you know, I can't control all that. Better, I don't right? know what's going to happen. But now I got my bookshelf organized. But did your that brain settle down a little bit? Oh, it felt great. Yeah. Because I've tried to control people. It doesn't work particularly well. I learned that. That was like lots of therapy along the way. And trying to control your wife, trying to control your kids, trying to control your staff, that's a bit of a disaster. And so I try to keep my control on like cutting the grass or uh, organizing my bookshelf or things like that. Actually, you're not cutting the grass. You're pushing a lawnmower. Oh, you're right. That's what you have control of. (laughs) Right? You're right. What if the engine breaks down? Yeah. Now you can't cut grass. Now, now I'm going to get stressed out about that. Yeah. Yeah. But wait a minute. What do you have control of? I can put the lawnmower in the truck and go to the mechanic. So there you go. Right. Right. No, I love I love how you did that. But you said little things like that can actually be therapeutic. That reprograms your brain. I remember you telling me that when I Absolutely. finished the library reorganization. Absolutely. But but just just to, you know a few other things if you feel this way. Um, first of all, you need some space. Get out, you know, if you're feeling this way, sit down and be quiet and build that in. Unplug, sit down, have some quiet time. Okay. Warren Buffett sits, I think it's I think it's an hour and a half a day, his whole career, that he has on his calendar, that he sits and looks out the window. That's it. Tony Blair told me when he was prime minister, he would take a half a day every week and go sit by a pond. Wow. Just to let his head clear. Okay. Quiet. Find some quiet time. 
Number two, observe your thinking. Start thinking about your thinking. Have I gotten negative? Have I gotten hopeless? Am I thinking in weird terms? Have I gone critical? Have I gone powerless? Start to observe your thinking. Make the two columns that I talked about, about the activities and control. Make sure you're connecting. Decatastrophize whatever's going on and get into a, this is huge guys, get into a larger narrative. That is brain science, I'm telling you. But it's also, you know, Gary, it's almost, it's almost like the person who wrote the Bible understood the brain. I really, <laughs> you know, I study the neuroscience. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. He tells us to connect. He tells us to worry about today and not the future. You can't add one cubit to your life or one day or one hour. He says, today has enough activities of its own. You got to worry about. But the other thing that he did was, and this gets things out of your subjective negative brain to the positive side because it, it connects it out of subjective emotionalism to linear sequencing, which is very important to re-engaging your prefrontal cortex, language, meaning, planning, all this kind of stuff, by the simple act of putting today in a larger narrative, all right, a larger narrative. The Bible, when I said whoever wrote the Bible understood the brain, what does God tell them every single time? Every single time. Remember, I'm the God that brought you out of slavery in Egypt with a mighty hand. I gave you these ways so that if you walk in them, you will always prosper. I parted the Red Sea. I did this. And then he gives you the end of the story. Okay? So picture yourself like this. You're in your den. All of us are doing this, right? I hope you're watching some movies every now and then. You got to unplug. Yeah. So I'm watching Netflix. I hit pause. What happens? The screen goes like this. It removes me out of that scene, and I get back here in God's view where there's no time. Hmm. I can see the whole movie, and it's in scenes. All right. There is some scene in that movie where... Jack Bauer or Indiana Jones, it does not look good. Or James Bond or mm -hmm. Jason Bourne, it does not look good if you're in that scene. All right? That's all we're in right now. Yeah. That's all we're in. This is a much longer movie. We've already read. I know who wins, right? But in our scene, we can't see what's coming, but we do know the writer and he's told us what's coming. And he also said, as bad as this is, I'm going to bring something good out of that. Yeah. So we get in this larger narrative. I, I, I'll tell you, you know, in, in the crash of 08, I'm seeing young, young gazillionaire people in finance that are early 30s, for example ready to jump off of buildings. And I'm putting together, putting them together in groups with these guys that are, you know, 65, they've been in the industry for whatever. And these 30 somethings are literally, some of them were feeling suicidal, literally. The 60 somethings, you know what they were saying? Well, you know, I remember when this happened in 87, in Black Monday in 87, and in 2000 when the bubble burst and, you know, it, he said, and they were put, they were painting this narrative. It says, here's what you do at those times. Here's the activities, because this is what's going to, here's what the trends and the patterns we know. And this is, they were organizing their activities of what you do in a crash, what you mm. do. So you are the author of Jason Bourne in that scene because you're Jason Bourne. Right. Or Wonder Woman. You get to, you get to, okay, what do I want my character to do in this scene that's going to prepare them for the rest of the movie? Because there's a big party coming at the end where James Bond and his honey are out there sipping champagne, floating on an island somewhere. You want to make it there, but it's going to depend on what you do in this scene. So a bit of no, larger narrative, you're going to be fine. I was telling, you know, Carrie earlier, remember we, we, we were talking about, I spent, 
I spent 12 years building a healthcare company. That's yeah, yeah. And I built this. I thought that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I had 40, um, you know, psych hospital treatment centers and outpatient clinics, all this throughout the Western United States. It's a sizable company. We were doing great until managed care came along and the healthcare industry went away and they no longer funded psych. Everything I had done for 15 years was all of a sudden I couldn't do it anymore. And that's where you guys have got to realize the essence of what you do is not not the same as how you do it. Right. If the horse and buggy people had realized we're not in the horse and buggy business, we're in the people moving business, then they could have morphed to trains and airplanes and all this other stuff. But some of them stay stuck. Borders went away, right? We're in the book Mm -hmm. business. No, you're in the getting information to people's eyeballs business or their ears. If the record company said, you know, (laughs) had said we're in the record business, they would have done what Steve Jobs did. No, we're in the getting music to people business. business. Yeah. So if you're thinking I'm in the gather big groups together on Sunday and sing some songs and deliver a message business, then you're going to really be despairing. But if you realize, no, that's not the business I'm in. I'm in the however you define it, making disciples or, you know, healing marriages or building families or reaching the lost. You get the essence of your DNA. Then you can change the mechanism and the how. But if you get stuck in this scene. Yeah. That's so helpful. Um, I would love there's a couple other questions I definitely want to ask, but I would love to think about healthy coping mechanism. So this interview is airing in the summer. It's sort of a reset. I think we know going back into the fall that, okay, things are not going to be anywhere near what we would hope they would be anytime soon. So as leaders prepare for the long haul. Or if we've reframed them, if we've reframed hope into not so specific about, I hope it will go back to the way it was, Right. And we have hope that I hope that God is going to lead me into a way of doing what he's called me to do that's thriving. And we're going to have a much greater chance of finding the realization of that hope than if it's tied to something. It's sort of like somebody's in love with their prom date. The person's an idiot, but they're smitten. And they're hoping, they're hoping this relationship will work out. Well, God's got better plans for you. You know, ditch the buff and you're going to find a better one. But we can't see it in the moment sometimes, right? Henry, there's been so much good stuff so far. I mean, sitting in a pond, making the list, sort of what your crazy brain is saying and, and then what you know to be true, uh, taking some space to breathe. What are some other healthy coping mechanisms for leaders who say, okay, we're going to have to prepare for a journey here. What can they do to make sure they've got the energy, the focus, and the health to move into the future? Well, let's just review the ones I've already said. I'm going to add some. Because you added a lot. Yeah, Space, space, quiet, observing your thinking, you know, defining the activities you can control, not control, getting connected, opening the system to other voices, You know, you're not going to come up with the answer in your head. You got to get with other leaders and you got to get with the leaders from other industries because they think differently than the church. And so you're going to find some things from somebody who works at Amazon that's going to help you. You got to get out of out of this closed circle. You've got to stop deep or you've got to, you know, decastrophe. You're decatastrophizing. Is that the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been accused of sometimes catastrophizing. Put in a bigger narrative. Look at your own history of when things have crashed before and make a little journal of what did I do? How did I get through that? Hmm. Wait a minute. I've been here before. How did I get through it? Remember the history of God's deliverance. That's what he tells us to do. Okay. Open up the system and also look at what other people are doing that they're doing successfully. That's like a bunch of stuff. Now, I'm going to add a few things. I want you to see this as a 
preparing yourself for what's coming next. Right. Okay. Opportunity, opportunity favors the prepared. So, for example, one of the things I've, I've really, really been doing this time is, is doing a lot of study and research on how can I do everything I'm doing digitally? How can I do it in different ways? Whatever the ways you need to be prepared, you know, just starting to think about whatever is going to happen. I've got to be ready for it. I think that's an important part of this. A uh, next thing is, again, remember, we don't know the future, but we do know the one who knows, all right? And so one of the things you've really got to be doing in this time is talking a lot to God. He's going to reassure you, okay? He's going to tell you, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? I mean, I don't mean to be tried here, but, you know, in terms of our work, I mean, it's his work anyway. Hmm. It's your company. Great. You want to shut it down? Fine. You're, you're the owner. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's a way in which we're, I mean, are we servants? Do we belong mm. to him? Or is this mine? If you want to hold on to this thing, however you had it, then he might have to rip it out of your little fingers, you know, because... It really is. I work for him. If he wants to have everything I do go up in smoke because he wants to use me in a different way. Yes, sir. I might not like it. It might be painful. All I'm saying is be grounded in him. Now, now there's another important step right now. It's really important, really important for you in the future. Make sure you're building reserves make sure you're building reserves all throughout the scriptures all throughout the scriptures the ant prepares in the summer for the winter yep okay joseph saw the hard times coming and he took a portion of the grain and he built up his reserves reserves are financial their people, their alliances, okay? And what I've learned in my life is whoever came up with the formula, well, you need six months of reserves, was on crack. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, we're already almost four months through this thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, so in all those areas, you've got to think of what are the stabilizing resources underneath me that if we run out of food, I'm not going to run out of food, metaphorically right. speaking. And those are not, it's not just money, but it's relationships and alliances and options and all this. So, you know, no matter what happens, I haven't limited my options and I hope this thing breaks. I hope this thing breaks. I hope this thing breaks. Yeah. Margin gives you options. Uh, I think that's true. Personally, Absolutely. I think it's terms of rest. I've taken my sleep really seriously in the last 15 years, my exercise a lot more seriously. And if you have a little bit of physical, emotional, financial, spiritual margin, you right. can spend it in a crisis. Um, exactly. If you don't, you go in on empty and then it's minutes to, you know, burning up or whatever. And that's, that sends you into panic itself, it you know, because it, it just, and, and it just, I mean, we got, you know, Jesus said, nobody starts to build a tower without first counting the cost because you only get halfway through and can't finish it. Well, we have to think of our, not just project tower, but we also have to think of, we're building a long tower here. And so, you know, like you're saying, Carrie, it's got to be your physical stamina, your health, your finances, your spiritual margins, your relationships, your alliances, your options. You know, some of you are one phone call away from your next job. Hmm. 
because you built a safety net. Yeah. Jesus told a parable about this. The guy's about to lose his job and he went and like stole money from his boss and gave it to a bunch of other people because he made friends and you know, your network is a big part of this. Oh, Some it's huge. Network, yeah, I've always wanted to preach that one. And I'm like, I just don't know. Every time I read it, which has been many times, I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to preach that one uh, yet, but I'm sure I will at some point, which is fascinating. Henry, I want to shift gears because it's been so helpful. One of the things we're all struggling with, and I've led remote teams for years and uh, done digital for a long time, as you have in different ways as well. But, you know, we're all in this intense virtual leadership period. So church is online. And even when it reopens, it's still going to be online for a lot of people. Uh, leading teams, I think the future workforce is much more remote, distributed, flexible than the past workforce. So we're all going to be doing this a lot more. Um, I hope so, because I, 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 I am not proud of how many millions of airplane models I have. <laughs> I know, I know. I've got, I, I got uh, for those of you who are watching, hang on. I want to show you the most useless thing I have in my possession right now. This is my uh, Super Elite Air Canada tag. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Absolutely nothing. That's what it means. Because uh, our border is closed for another 60 days or so. Uh, so, you know, it's top tier status with my airline out of Toronto. But uh, yeah, we're all, we're all going to do this for a lot longer than we were used to. What does that do to your brain? What does that do to your energy? There's, you know, science around Zoom fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to just talk about the dynamics of leading virtually as opposed to in person, whether that's church or staff leadership? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, a lot of us kind of know it from experience, um, but I'll highlight a few things. What I think there's a good side of it because the good side of it is in some ways, I think there's more connection in one way because people are kind of like panicked about the non-connection. So they're connecting more. Right. Mm. And so they're doing more of these things because it's front of mind. I don't see this person in the hall. We better. And so it's almost like they've added a little structure that gets them more connected. And I think the other thing that is increasing the connection is that everybody's feeling a little vulnerable right now and when we're coming together from our weaknesses and fears and all of that that's that's creating a lot of a lot of good connection so the good side is i think there's more connection the bad side is i think there's less connection hmm. and and what i mean by that is i really worry about um and there you know there is research about this too but there's things that happen incarnationally that don't happen you know digitally there are, you know, there's there's literal the the non-understandable mind-body connection that God is wired into when he breathes spirit into flesh, that we need flesh. Okay. We need we need touch, we need people's presence. There's things that happen in mirror neurons, there's things that happen in the biochemistry of being in the energy spheres of people. I'm not getting new agey here. We can right. measure this with, with, you know, with machines. It builds a baby's brain, for example, the connection being held that you couldn't do on Zoom calls and being in mommy and her daddy's presence. We, I worry about that some people aren't getting enough of that. And I also worry about the brain in this way and I think because this is the way we're working, that people are also spending a lot more time online because their whole world is kind of gotten right here. Go out in the yard, man. Yeah. Go walk your dog. Go walk in the park, sit in a chair, do something tactical, shoot some baskets. But there's this pull because we're having to work this way. It's kind of like our whole life is being lived right here. I think that's not a good thing. Yeah. We're losing out on just um, life experience. And so I think I think we have to worry about that. Um, 
And don't an, 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 another big thing is I, I do think that and, and from a brain perspective, um, it's got you too much online. And so also when we're online, we really have to, and this is what the great performers do. You have to guard yourself against your brain turning into an ADD brain mm. because you're constantly being bombarded outside of what you're supposed to be focused on. Right. And so you've got to have, that's why I said the priority sheet that I make, the activity sheet. If I've got to really do something that's important, that requires what we call deep thought, shut down your email, shut down your texts. Okay. Shut it all down and focus and don't let your mind, because it's going to get hardwired. We're talking hardwiring. It's going to get hardwired to be like this. Yeah. Because if you stay online all day, that's kind of what happens. You don't want a brain like that. You mm -hmm. can't function like that. And so sitting by the pond or uh, staring out the window or, you know what I'm finding too. Because or shutting down your browser and your alerts and all that to focus on your sermon. I found that too because I have I was on planes a lot and in meetings a lot in person, so my life was highly digital, but also uh, analog as well or physical. And I found since we've gone into lockdown that I almost instantly crave like I got to close a laptop. I just got to go into the yard, even if it's like pulling weeds in the garden, or uh, you know I'm going to wash my car by hand rather than run it through. But doing something with my hands, something physical, uh, yeah. is really good. Uh, for me. So I would, I would echo that. Well, ask yourself this, you know, what would I do if I didn't have a phone or a computer? And go do that. A lot, yeah, but a lot of people go, die. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's no life apart from the digital life. And, and another thing is that I think you've got to, and, and we, we can talk about this a little Later, I can share some of some of my practices, but yeah. but one of the one of the really important things is I think you know the, the natural boundaries we have in life are time and space. Hmm. Right, so you used to have time and space around work. I went to work; it was a place, and I was there from eight to five or whatever, and then I came home, and that wasn't work. That was my life, my personal life. Well, time and space are gone with the internet, unless you create them. So I learned a long time ago, um, when we first first um, had Olivia, our, our oldest, um, I, I was working at home. I had sold the company, I was working at home, and quickly learned, I didn't need a physical space for meetings or anything like that anymore. I needed a physical space for my brain hmm. to create a space that work happened in. Okay. And I needed a time space. So I made some very clear boundaries around time and space. Work happens here in this spot. It happens at certain times. Okay, now now we're on lockdown, so work is in my study, right? But I made some rules that I live by. And by and large, started back then. No writing, no email. No email. No work email, no, no email. After six o'clock at night. Mm. So you That's literally tough. leave the figurative office or the room, and then it's like, I'm home. I'm done. Almost done. like you were in manufacturing, right? I'm more and more morphing into that space. It's like you can't, you can't work on the assembly line when you're at home. Uh, yet the problem we have is these devices follow us everywhere. So you can work till the moment you go to bed. And That's difficult. Right. That's right. And it's just not good. We... Um, and the whole virtual thing, you know, it's great. It's great and it's horrible. So, mm. you know, are you going to master it or is it going to master you? You know, we hear these phrases, but they're actually important. Um, and time and space is a big one. Wow. Can you walk us through a few more of your personal boundaries as we wrap up? 
What are some ones that have really been meaningful to you? I mean, you wrote literally wrote the book or a series of books on boundaries and are the authority on that. Do you mean in life in general or like now, especially in this time? Well, let's let's do it in uh, in semi lockdown, new normal ish territory. What are some boundaries? Because I think a lot of people, even their old boundaries, it's like that was my other life. So talk to them in this life. Okay, at the risk, Carrie, of sounding like kind of evangelically correct. Okay. Because I don't mean it like that at all. But my number one most important one is my time with God. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now. Yeah. And I don't want to sound evangelically weird. But I have really, really, really tried to guard that time. And in that time, I sit, actually start with Psalm 91 every day. Hmm. And I pray through it. Go read it. It's incredible in this time period. I start there. And then what I do is, I'll just give you the reality of the practices if you want. Um, Yeah, yeah. I'll read three chapters of the Old Testament as I'm working my way through it again. I read three chapters there. I read a couple of Psalms. I read a chapter of Proverbs that goes with that day of the calendar. So today's the 10th. I'll read Proverbs chapter 10. And then I read a chapter of the New Testament. And what I try to do, I, always, I don't always have time for this because all of this will take a while. Um, it, if I do it like I like to do, it takes about an hour and a half. Um, I have a journal that as I'm going through that, I'm writing down the things that call it apply in a deep way that, you know, and and so then I do that. Um, and then I have a daily prayer sheet. I've got thing. I'll pray for this area of life on Monday, these people on Tuesday, the company on Wednesday or church, you know, just stuff. I'll go through my list and then I try to, and I'm not perfect about this. I'm just giving you this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's super then, good. And I try to have a time where I, I just, I just try to um, connect and listen. And and there's three things that I'm always, always asking for in this time, very, very specifically begging God for. Is I pray for. He says, you know, seek the gift of prophecy. I pray for prophecy. I pray for wisdom. And I pray for gifts of knowledge because in a lot of my work, I need supernatural revelation and he gives it to me. Oh, wow. And I, I see that, especially in my consulting work or whatever I, I do, I get, but I beg for that. And I, I always ask for, especially, you know, my, my work is kind of like, it's sort of like in the wisdom knowledge field. I mean, you have yeah, yeah. no, got how stuff, I don't mean to sound weird, but, that's the gifts that I pray for. And and I ask him every day in a pretty extensive way. You know, I quoted Ephesians 2.10 where it says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he's laid down beforehand that we should walk in. So I pray every day and ask him, continue to help me be the tool that you need. And I pray like when, when he built the temple. It says that God supernaturally gave to the workers skills for their particular job. Yeah. The artisans, the bricklayers, the, you know, all of them. He supernaturally gave them that ability for whatever their job was. I beg for that. And David said, God, you strengthen my arms for battle. I I really want God, especially in this time. I don't know what's going to be required of me, but I don't have it. And will you please give it to me? Mm -hmm. And then I pray for, and I find that he answers this so specifically, Carrie. I pray for, I don't know what's cu- cu- coming up next week, but give me the content that I need. I'll come across an article or a weird link to some piece of research that was totally random. I go, oh my gosh, there it is. Yeah. He does it. He gives us manna by the day. I hear you. So I don't know how to go through a time like this without abiding. And I don't mean to sound weird, guys. I do this out of weakness, inability, and fear. Just fear. I need God right now. I don't know where this is going. But 
anyway, so that's the big one. My other, um, my other big boundary is around the schedule. Um, we have had such a rich family time in this time. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm so busy. I'm busier than I've ever been. But we tried to, we've really set up a routine and we stick to it. So, you know, we get up in the morning, we'll gather in the kitchen, we'll take the puppy out. We, we're, we're raising a new puppy right now and yeah, yeah. it's training. I go to work, treat it like a regular day. I go to my study. I emerge about noon. We hang around the island. You know, we all kind of meet there for lunch. Everybody's kind of making their own sandwich or whatever. I go back into my study. I'm there until about 530. I'll unplug. And that's my time. And I got to wind down. Do different things at different times. But everybody knows, don't bother me. Mm. <laughs> and after, I don't know. 45 minutes an hour, if I'm lucky. We all meet in the kitchen and we're, we prep dinner together, have a glass of wine, talk. We have dinner together as family. And then most nights, the, the kids are having a little different schedules now with some stuff. But most nights we'll have some sort of like game night as a family. Or if the kids don't do that, Tori and I will go veg out on the, you know, on the patio or, you know, We'll, we'll binge on a show or something. So the routine, those boundaries have been really, really important. Yeah. Really, really important. And the boundaries of not letting the urgent crowd out, the vital of talking to the people I need to talk to. Mm. Really important. Do you think, final question, there will be permanent changes like as you look forward, we're all learning something in this season by involuntary lockdown. Do you think you'll go back to like super top tier platinum status? Will you scale back your traffic? What what will you do? I don't think so for two reasons. One's external and one's internal. Um, I think there's some some character changes that. I know that it happened in me. Now, when I say character, I don't mean like moral character. Yeah, like, I know what you mean. You know, evangelicals, you know, somebody's got a good character, they don't lie, cheat, or steal. Well, come on, that's five-year-old permission to play. <laughs> right? I'm talking about character in the Bible sense of, I wrote a book called Integrity, right? And it means to be integrated, where all the parts are working together. Yeah. Sort of like the character in a movie. What are they like? Are they like? Are they impulsive? Are they big picture? Are they detailed? That's that's what I mean by character. Well, the word character, the the history of the word, it means an engraved mark. It experiences that in, in the New Testament, you know, it's talking about experience. So our experiences engrave upon us a makeup, right? I don't think any of us is going to come out of this experience without being. In, it engraves some things on us. And I think some of those that are going to stick with me is I think some, I think I've been able to really get a different revelation on some of the Martha activities as opposed to the Mary activities. Mm -hmm. That's gone in a, in a little deeper way. I think some of the experiencing again in a deeper way, the richness of some of the ways we are the, our family rhythms have happened. Um, it's sort of like Jack Nicholas went back to the basics in 79, right? Yeah. Teach me and how to golf. Yeah. Teach me. Yeah. God, teach me how to be a human again. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but I think work wise, I think, I think with a lot of my work, I'm going to be saying, so do you really think we need an offsite for that or, or can't right. we zoom? I'm with you. And I think a lot of a lot of people are gonna be saying that. I'm with you. Uh, and the other thing is, um, just in terms of digital, I mean, I'm in the digital um sort of, you know, the what do you call it, training world, right? Yeah. That um just been able to, you know, use this time to create new new offerings to people and new ways that, that we can do training, new ways that we can do hangouts. So I know there's a lot of stuff. I hope that I don't take forward in new things that I do. And I think everybody's going to be like that. And, and the external reality is I don't think people, 
don't think the external world is going to want to have as many meetings as they used to. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. A lot of your, your people are really like, you know, going to church in their underwear. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's 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 hard to get out of. And you know, it's interesting talking about the physiological, the the moral changes, character changes. Uh, I was having a, my son lives a couple hour flight away, and so we can't see each other right now. He's on the east coast, and uh, we did about a ninety minute uh, FaceTime last week. And he goes, "Dad, you're different." He says, "You've uh-huh. slowed down. You're more present. You're." listening more you're not as rushed or distracted and i'm like and that's something i don't want to lose i don't want to lose as a result of this season so i echo that and i'm loving the family rhythms and frankly i hope i get downgraded three or four levels of status on the airline in the next year that would be okay that would be just fine uh so henry this is rich uh boundaries.me and then you also have churches that heal right which people yeah. can get at churches that heal.com yeah, if you're if you're in the church world, if I can say a little, a little say, go to churchesthatheal.com because what I've tried to do is put together really we've been working on this for two years a comprehensive program to help churches deal with the hurt that's all around them. This we call a mental health crisis, but what we're talking about is really hurting people. And there's great harvest to be had if we have a few tools to know how to to open the doors of the church and message it in a way where hurting people want to run towards the church instead of away from it, where people that never would come to church are invited because they're anxious or depressed or struggling in a relationship. And it's a program that I won't go into all the details, but it starts with helping the pastoral staff. Then it goes to community wide events and outreach It's all right there available on the big screen. And then it goes to small groups and individuals. So churchesthatheal.com, and there's a lot of training videos that I put in there for pastors. We will link to everything in the show notes. Henry, as always, it's a joy. And I think you really helped a lot of leaders kind of redeem their summer and this season today. So sincerely, personally, thank you. Well, thank you, Gary. It's always good to be with you, and we'll do it again sometime. You betcha. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.